We are I, I, live. We are live. I think we are live. We are. So, yeah. Uh, no more picking <laughs> <Hello>. our nose. <laughs> Stop. Uh. Showtime. Showtime. Uh, how's it going, Golden? It's going good in sunny but cold Santa Ana, California. Yeah, it is sunny but cold. It's kind of yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of cozy actually. It's it's, it's wintry. It's Christmassy. Yeah, but I had an awesome run on the back bay this morning. So that's yet, good. It was beautiful. Fantastic. Beautiful but cold. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I'm doing really well. Just hanging out in my kitchen. Yeah. You know, just doing the whole work from home thing. I'm talking yep. to you now. So yep. aren't, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're we're just kind of hanging out for a minute. We just started this live stream. We're going to give people a chance to, to log in or tune in or whatever you call it on the, in the interwebs here. And then nice. we'll get going. We're going to have ourselves a, a, a chat about oxes in just a minute oh, here. Excellent topic. And I see you I were agree. able to stash the kids away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> for a small time. I, got, I got like 20 minutes here. So we, we got to really get into this. Right. Before they're literally climbing on my head. And totally get it. <laughs> you're going to have to send a, a search party to bail me out. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. What do you say? Should we should we get going? I think we got hey, I say we rock it, Jason. I actually have no idea where to even look at the viewers. So I'm just going to say, hey, people hey. are watching. Let's, let's get it going. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about auxes um, on a mixing console. Um, we'll kind of just set up... Uh, in general, what an aux is and what they're used for. And then um, I have my TouchMix 16 set up here. And we'll actually go ahead and step through um, just kind of a general aux setup. We'll show you how to get to an aux on the TouchMix and, and how to adjust the faders and, and then maybe how to get into the settings and adjust some of the aux pickoff points and other things like that. But first, let's go ahead and just tell everybody um, fundamentally what an aux is. Um, which is uh, an, it's very simply an additional uh, mix or an additional output on a mixing console that you can create um, a discrete mix that is independent from your main mix, which goes to your, your main outputs. Uh, that, I mean, right. that's, that's, that's in the most basic terms what an aux is. And if anyone's familiar... So what can we actually use those auxes for? Exactly. So what do you, what do you need? So you have your, your main mix, right? Your, your, yeah. your main mix going to your, your PA system, which is what everybody's mm -hmm. hearing. But then you, you have these additional outputs that you can set up different mixes for. What, what do you need to do? Why, why would you need to do that? I can think of a couple. Why don't you give me one? Monitor mixes, for sure. That's it. That's that's probably the, the most common use for auxes, to set up monitor mixes. So if you have if musicians there, I'm sure you're familiar with what those are, or if you've ever seen right. a live performance, you know, there are speakers, usually wedge speakers, that are like on the front of the stage that are pointing backwards at the musicians on stage or the band on stage. Sometimes, you know, bands will have headphones or in-ear monitors. Um, so uh, aux mixes are what run that those content, the content that would go to, you know, your in-ears or your stage monitors on stage so that the musicians that are playing um, can hear themselves and can hear a mix of, you know, whatever they need to hear to be able to perform, you know, within the ensemble. Exactly. Um, I also use my aux mixes for creating a discrete broadcast mix. So yes. When tell, my us, tell us a little bit more about that application. That's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I work at Campus Jacks, and I'm wow. constantly running live streams. Uh -huh. And what happens is I have my house mix, but then we're running a, a, a discrete mix to our live stream. And what happens when drums are already loud in the house and the electric guitars are loud in the house, I need to, if, if I were to send my house mix to the stream, all you would hear is some vocals and um keyboards and an acoustic guitar because I had the faders down really low in my discrete, uh, in my house mix and you wouldn't be able to hear right. anything. Yeah. So what yeah, I so do in, is I create in the room, right? The, the drum set is there. So it was pretty loud. Yeah. Was, you got a guitar amp on the stage. And so you can hear that stuff fine if you're there. Oh yeah. So and you I have don't a need perfect really a lot mix of that going for the house. Yeah. Reinforced in the house. 
you know, but over right. your stream, you know, you're not you're on over your computer or however you're listening to that. You're not there. So you're not next to the live drum set or you don't hear the guitar amp right in front of your face. Right. So what I do with that discrete ox mix is I push up my drums as loud as they need to be in the desk in, in that discrete mix to mm -hmm. make it into the live stream. And I can create a, a really beautiful sounding studio like mix using a discrete auxiliary mix. Yeah. A discrete stereo auxiliary mix. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah, great. Another um, pretty common example of what an OSC would use for that sort of the same um, principle could apply to maybe sending uh, a discrete mix to a recording device. So your example, um, kind of broadcasting that more or less, you got a mm -hmm. mix kind of, of a live event and you're broadcasting that out somewhere, you need a, a special or independent mix for that. Um, you know, if you have a recording device or you're recording the show as well, the same thing would apply, right? Uh, if, on, on, if you were to send that same mix that's in the house to a recorder, you'd have the same problems. On the recording, the drums would yeah. be really low, the guitar would be really low. So you want to set up an independent mix so the recording gets the proper levels that it needs to sound Precisely. good to be recorded. Same thing. Um, another thing, uh, another common use for auxes uh, would be to set your PA system up with a, the main left and right speakers and a subwoofer on independent channels. So you run your main uh, left and right speakers off of your main mix outputs, and then you set up a subwoofer on one of your auxes uh, so that you can A, feed it a, a tailored uh, mix. So, um, you don't need vocals, you know, and guitar and stuff like that, you know, yes. to a subwoofer. Um, even if you have a crossover engaged, that's got content. It just is not needed. So you can only you can you can give it only the things that you want in your subwoofer, um, and then and then you can give it uh, you know apply those filters uh, independently. So you can build yourself mm -hmm. your own crossover, uh, and then you have uh, an independent level control. So you can actually adjust the volume of your subwoofer and your main PA uh, speakers independently. So you can really kind of fine tune. Uh, you know, your, your overall PA balance. Yes. Yeah, so what it does is it gives you a level of control you didn't have before by running those ox fed subs. I'm looking forward to you showing us yeah, how so, that all uh, comes together on a mixer. I'm dive into that now. So that's more or less what an ox is, kind of some things you do with it. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my mixer cam and uh, we're going to step through, you know, how you might do some of this stuff. Uh, so go ahead and punch over now and I can pop myself in the corner here. So I can still talk to you guys. Um, I see there is a question here uh, from Facebook. Can you send reverb or effects to an, an aux pre-fader? Um, that's a little bit more of a, a complicated answer. Um, and I'll get into that uh, in a little bit. Let's, let's, let's kind of start at the beginning uh, and, and walk through how to create an aux mix. Uh, and then maybe we can discuss how effects work within an aux mix at that point. Perfect. Cool. Um, so here, what we're looking at here is my main mix. So this is the mix that is going to go out my main left and right output. Um, you can see over in the corner here, I'm in my main mix. And then down the side of my screen here, I also, I'll, I'll apologize, I know that my, my camera feed is a little glitchy for some reason. My video mixer is fighting with uh, our live stream here. I couldn't, be able, I couldn't troubleshoot the issue before we went live. So my apologies. Um, anyway, we've got these assignment buttons down the side of the screen here. Uh, and that is how you access your different aux mixes. Uh, on the TouchMix 16, which is what I'm, what I'm using here, this is my own uh, personal TouchMix mixer here, uh, that's 16. I have um, six available aux mixes, or, or mono aux mixes with an additional uh, two stereo. So I've got, there's a couple of quarter inch connectors, which gives you the, the two stereo um, quarter inch output auxes. And then there are six uh, mono XLR auxes on the back. These buttons here allow me to access the discrete mixes for all of those. So again, my main mix here, if I just punch into aux one there with the assignment button, now this is my mix for aux one. And I can step through all of the different fader banks and I can create a completely custom and independent mix for my aux one output. And then whatever I have connected to the physical XLR output, this is what is, I'm, I'm going to be feeding that essentially. So if I have this going to a stage monitor on stage, um, you know, maybe this is my, this is a band and there's a vocalist on stage, like the example you gave earlier, um, I could come into my aux one mix here, which is the wedge that I have designated for the singer and 
I can create a mix for them um, special to what they need. Clearly, probably they're going to want to hear themselves. So you give them a good amount of themselves and then you kind of ask them, what else, you know, what else do you need to be listened to so that you can kind of keep up and play along and be comfortable? And you just, you know, can you select just like the main mix? You know, you select any of the faders and you bring them up to the appropriate level until they're happy and you're good. And that's it. You just created a Nox mix. It's as simple as that. You know, it's really no different than, than mixing a main mix. The biggest difference is you're not sending that mix to the mains. You're sending that somewhere else. In this case, a singer, um, you know, if you wanted to create a, a discrete mix, like um, we were talking about uh, a broadcast mix or a recording mix, another thing you could do to kind of start that out, um, you could go into your main mix and simply copy what you have for the main mix and paste it in there as your starting point. And then just all you have to do from there is adjust the things that need adjusting. Like uh, in our example earlier, the drum set, you know, if we have that really low in the house PA, you know, we just adjust the drum set faders and the guitar faders and things like that. And that it's incredibly simple to do that. You know, within my main mix here, I can see, I don't really have much of a mix going on uh, other than my own channel. This is uh, the, Mixture I'm using to broadcast my voice right now, as well as give the demonstration. So it's pretty nice. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to copy my main mix here, I would simply, uh, let me see here. If I might have rearranged my user button. Let me go check. But by default, here we go, yeah. If I'm in my user button setup, user buttons two and three, which are here and here, are defaulted to copy and paste respectively. So I'll go ahead and I'll land my screen on the main mix here. I'll simply hit my copy button, which is user two, and I can go into an aux mix here and I can hit U3 for paste. And there we go. Just like that, it pastes my entire fade mix from aux one. And then I go and I take whichever channels I need to adjust and bring them up to whatever level I need them at for that mix. Simple as that. So, so I have a good question coming in from William. Excellent. Here on Facebook. And he wants to know, how do you mix multiple in-ear monitors along with wedges. And I thought since I'm doing that quite a bit um, where I work that I might address that. Yeah, please. Um, first of all, as far as wedges goes, there's this common misconception that the more speakers you have on stage, the louder it's gonna be on stage. Mm. And that's not necessarily the case. No. The more discrete wedges or speakers that you have on stage, the more you can tailor those wedges and monitors to be exactly what the musicians need and only what they need, thereby lowering the stage volume. And that makes it easier. You know, when you're able to keep your stage volume lower and your reference for what you're referencing ahead of that, then you're able to hear better. So when I'm mixing monitors, I give each musician their own wedge and give them exactly what they need mm -hmm. and, and tailor it to what they need. Yeah, if, I mean, if, if yeah. you have the equipment to do that, that's that's the best case scenario. Yeah. yeah. Now, he, William is asking about including in-ear monitors along with it. Mm -hmm. um, many of my bands will come mm -hmm. with their own in-ear wireless devices. And I will take those out of one of the aux outputs, just like I would have wet it like a wedge. But instead of plugging it into the wedge, I'll plug it into their in-ear transmitter instead. And that's how I create the monitor in your monitor mix. And a lot of my bands are a combination of wedges and in your monitor mixes. Yeah, that's pretty so cool. I'll have, yeah. Some people don't know how to reference them very well. And, and some people, it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. For me as a singer, it's one of the best things that's happened to me because I can, um, I don't have to push as hard. I, I feel like I get, hear a, um, a full frequency spectrum from my voice, which is paramount to singing with good pitch. Absolutely. So, yeah. And the other cool thing is I don't normally give control of wedges to my musicians, but if they have in your monitor mixes, they'll give me their phones and I will yep. hook them up to my router and they will run their own in ear mixes. And I never yep. have to deal with them all night. That's such a blessing if they if you can set that up yeah the, the touch mix has the ability to connect to up to 12 um tablet or smartphone devices so 
all you do, you get everyone to, uh, you know, connect to the, to the Wi-Fi that the mixer has set up here. And then in this screen here, which I've just come to, which is our remote control settings, um, you know, any connected device will show up over here. And then you have the option of assigning what they have permissions to access. So you can just give everybody their own aux mix on their device and they can take care of it themselves. And that kind of frees you up to just be the front of house engineer and you don't have to worry about them because yeah. they're handing when along. When people are running their own ears, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, William, has another, William has another question in, in, in relation to that. Oh, Is sure. it common to use one ear on and one ear off? So one's referencing a wedge and one's referencing the in-ear yeah. monitor. I have people that do that. You'll want to yeah. be very careful with your hearing if you do that because <laughs> the user tends to listen to their in-ear six to 10 dB louder when they have one ear in. So you, you want to be very careful how you're, how you're doing that so you don't hurt your hearing. <laughs> yeah. You see, <laughs> but I, I do know people who do that. Yeah, a word yeah. of precaution. I, I see a lot of vocalists do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they want to hear the ambient sound. They want to feel what the crowd yep. is feeling. And I totally get that. Um, if a way to accomplish that, if you wanted to use both ears is to set up room mics, and then you can dial in an appropriate round, uh, an appropriate amount of room mics so that you can hear what's going on in the room and still feel mm -hmm. what the audience is feeling, but have your both ears in and you then you'll be able to lower your your listening volume, which will protect your hearing, but hear very well what's going on with the audience. Yeah, nice. That's a good suggestion there. Um, cool. Well, uh, let's. You want to address that uh, question about effects and talk a little bit about uh, effects at this point? I mean, we've pretty yeah, much. Yeah, that, that's a good one because I get asked uh, that a lot. Why don't you yeah, show us how to do that? Do that? I mean, up to this point, um, you know. I've shown you how simple it is to, to get to the oxes and, and just create an ox mix very simply. Um, so where the effects come in, um, it gets a little more complicated. So when you're dealing with effects, I'm just going to punch to a random channel here. Um, so you can send, uh, I was already messing with this. Um, so within each channel, you know, you have these effects sliders, so you can be sending your channel to any of your effects. Uh, at whatever level you'd like, what, what you're actually doing here uh, when you adjust these sliders is you're sending this channel to this effect processor, um, which is located over here. So under your effects masters bank, you've got your, I've got my four effects channels on my TouchMix 16 here, uh, which you can think of sort of as processors or uh, inserts if you're familiar with um, older analog consoles and where you'd have an effects insert and then a return. That's sort of how these work. Um, they are built into the board, so we're not really sending them away and then returning them. Um, but the channels, as you you know, send your signal of each channel to an effect, it's coming into the processor. It's being sent to one of these four effects processors, and then at, at to whatever amount you designate with the slider, and then from there, the effects processor itself outputs to the main output. So that's just why they are on their own channels here. So each effect processor is sending its signal to the main output. So your channel signal, if you can kind of picture this, is go, you know going to the main output in your main mix, and then you drag up that little effect slider in your effects page, and then it's sending that amount of that channel to that effects processor, and then the effects processor is sending its output to your main output. Um, where this is important to understand is you have the ability to send more than one channel to a single effects processor. So what I just did here, um, I sent this this vocal ch channel to, my, to a few effects here. Now, if I were to go to a different channel, let's say I had this set up as a kick drum, don't ever send a kick drum to a reverb, but <laughs> uh, for example, I will just use this channel. So now I can send this this channel to effects one, the same reverb. So now I've got two channels that are going to the same reverb. And then that reverb processor is essentially sent outputting its entire signal out to the main output. And what you're actually hearing um, is sort of a blend of your your effects output and then your your dry signal. You know, it's coming your your signal here is coming to the main output. But it's also being now routed through this effect, and then the effects is also sending it to the main output as well. In my case, in my example now, I've sent two channels to my effects one here. So my effects one is sending its complete output 
to the main output here, which includes signal from two channels. And in the main mix, you know, that sounds really good. And I've got it all dialed in really sweetly because I still do have independent control of how much I'm sending it to the effect to begin with. Okay. So I, I still do have, I still maintain some pretty granular control of, of, of the wetness of the effect in the main output. Now, when you start introducing effects into auxes, you have one step less control, meaning you lose this step here. You can only do this stage once. You can only do this within the main mix. Once you've set this level, that is just kind of the amount of signal that that effects processor is getting. When you go into your aux, if you want to introduce that affected signal into your aux, you would come into the effects masters page here. So now I have my same four channels, but now I have them in the aux mix. And if I were to bring them up, so if I were to bring up this effect, I want that, I want to hear that reverb in this aux, I bring that up. So now um, we'll, we'll be able to hear the signal from this reverb channel in our aux mix, but it's going to be the total and complete signal from the reverb effect. And in this case, I've sent two channels for that effect. So I'm going to get the affected signal of both of those channels in my aux now. And Maybe that's fine, um, but it, it does give you kind of um, a step less. Uh, uh, so I'm going to play the part of the singer now. I'm yes. the singer. I'm in front of my monitor. You say, ooh, that effect sounds good. Mm -hmm. And what you've done is you've used the snare reverb along by adding that same reverb to my vocal. I like the way my vocal sounds in my monitor. But hey, um, can you get rid of like the snare drum? I'm hearing like this really washy snare sound in my monitor. And there's and the problem. You would say, you would say <laughs> well, unfortunately, I don't really have control to do that because exactly. I, you know, I have really like my main mix and I don't want to get rid of the snare drum, the reverb on the snare drum there. So you just kind of have to deal with it. Or right. um, the, the, other, the other answer, if you have another effect processor that is free, um, you can just set up you set it up with an additional reverb, an identical reverb, another instance of the same reverb. You send the snare to one channel and the vocal to the other channel. That And that will give you the ability to kind of just bring up the reverb to have the vocalist routed to in the aux. And you give the one with the snare drum out of it. Everyone's happy. Um, but, you know, it does. Now you're using two reverbs, two identical reverbs, and it's taking up two of your effects processors, two of your four total effects processors um, to accomplish that. And, you know, if you're... If whatever you're mixing it can accommodate that, if you I mean, if you can utilize those two effects processors for those purposes, great, do that. Um, but sometimes, you know, you need to you need your other you know you got your reverb for your vocalist, and you need your other three for other things that we're sweetening up. Did we lose you there for a second? Yeah, my huh. internet cut out. We had outages yesterday oh, on Spectrum, so they're probably still in play. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it back quickly. Hey. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so there you go. So that's that's sort of a, a brief uh, little discussion about you know the effects within the auxes. I hope that was that was clear. It is a uh, it does get a little kind of tricky, kind of trying to picture the routing of all that stuff. Um, but that is an important aspect of it to understand. You know, if are if you are intending to use effects in your aux mixes, so you'll find that vocalists are the one who ones who are requesting. Mm -hmm to hear wetness in their monitors. So for that reason, if you keep your reverbs and delays for vocals separate from yeah. all the instruments, you usually won't run into that problem. Yeah. And that's, that's really the key. Just if you, if you have, if you can figure out how to separate them out um, so that what at the point where you're introducing them into your, your reverb or your monitors, you don't run into other instruments bleeding into the mix that are, right. that are not fun. So, um, all right. So this is, what about still... Oxfed subs? Oxfed subs. Yeah, let's talk about that yeah. a little bit. My my picture froze for myself on my end. Am I still? Can you still see me moving? Yeah, you, you still got your hands in the air like you just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, then I won't worry about it. Um, Oxfed. <laughs> but it looks good. Another ox here. So essentially, um, you know, this part of it is no different. So, and when we're uh, creating a mix for a subwoofer where clearly we're only going to include things um, that we want in the sub, like a kick drum. Like I've got this channel labeled as a kick drum. Um, so a kick drum, bass guitar, um, 
if, if there's a keyboard, uh, maybe the low end of the keyboard, or if you have some, some cool like, low end synth parts, um, or um, if you have um, backing tracks or playback music that, that is, has some heavy bass content, you want that stuff in there, you could include that. But you know, primarily, you know, things, things that are have in, intended low frequency content, kick drum, bass guitar, um, a, 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 an acoustic guitar, electric guitar, certainly a vocalist, you know, has no place being routed to a subwoofer. So Kind of, so build your, your mix first and, and build it appropriately. And what I would do with this um, is, you know, whatever channels you want to include in the subwoofer mix, bring those to Unity um, instead of, you know, an, a, a specific amount. Just bring those right to Unity. And here's why. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into the setup of the aux here. So we're going to access the settings by so, um, pressing on the name of the aux up here, the gray area above the, its output fader here. Um, we're going to select the setup on the screen, and then we're going to adjust the pickoff point. Now, so the pickoff point in an aux is the point at which it is receiving its signal. Now, by default, this is pre-fader, uh, which means the signal is entering the mixer, coming through the preamp, going through the digital... So, Jason, computer. really quick, your touch mix video is frozen, so if you're able to refresh oh, that... Oh, okay. And we can see what you're doing. Let's see here. It is totally frozen on my end. Let me uh, do, do, do. stop cam for a second. Can you still hear me? Uh, we still got you. Yep. All right. Now, did that come back? It still looks frozen to me. All right. I'm going to try one more thing. I'm going to stop this. Give me, uh, give me about 10 seconds here. <laughs> okay. Do 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 Okay, am I back? Let me see here. There we go. I got there you go. All right. Yes. Here we go. Go back over here. Very good. Okay. So I don't know at what point I froze. Do you need me to go back through how I got to this screen? Back up on how you got to that screen. Okay, cool. So we're out here in our our aux mix. We're we're sending uh, our channel to our subwoofer, right? And we're gonna bring them to Unity, which is right there. Um, so now I'm gonna get, I need to get into the settings of my aux mix. And to do that, I'm gonna select the name of the aux output channel here, which is aux three in this case, I select that. And it's gonna take you to the, you know, the channel settings, which I was already on this screen. So that was there, you know, if it had taken me into any other screen within here, I'm simply gonna select the setup tab right there to take me to the setup screen. And now, uh, we have our aux pickoff points here, uh, which are what we're going to be adjusting. Uh, you can see I'm on pre-fader right now, which is the default. And for most cases, certainly when you're setting up a monitor mix, um, you, that's where you want it. You want it on pre-fader. And that means that um, the signal is coming down into the aux right before the channel fader in the main mix. So here's my main mixer. There's all my faders for my main mix. So the channel is coming in to the mixer through the preamp. Uh, through the converter, uh, it's going through the uh, dynamic section, it's going through the EQ, it's going through the pan control, and then it's stopping right before the actual channel level and then being picked off and sent to the aux. So what you end up with is, you know, when you're mixing a, a monitor mix, you can take your channel and you can set it to an independent level for that aux, but you're still getting all of the processing you know, that precedes the channel fader level in your main mix. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, when you move the main mix faders, when you're in pre-fader mode, it doesn't affect then it does the not aux. affect your aux mix. Right, which is what we want for for a lot of... For, for monitors. What do we need for, for subs? For subs, we want to change it to post-fader. So now that pickoff point is coming after our main mix fader level. Um, so now if we adjust the, the faders in our main mix, we're going to hear those changes in the aux, which is why we've set our faders to unity. Um, when a channel is set to unity, which is that tick mark indicated with the U there, that means that this stage, that this fader is uh, ha has no effect on the signal. Um, it is not adding gain or is not subtracting gain. So it's so by setting it to unity, it's going to come into the, to this channel at whatever level it was set to at the point when it was delivered to the channel. Okay. Now by changing the aux pickoff point to post fader. Now our main mix faders are dictating the level of that signal. So what you hear in the main mix for that channel is exactly what you're going to hear 
in the in this aux mix for that channel and that's what you want for a subwoofer you you don't want to have to come in here and adjust things independently for the sub you know you want to just have that content going to the sub and be controlling it with still with your your main channel faders so if you adjust your kick drum or your bass guitar you're you're, you're still that still um translate to the overall mix even though that signal now is let's say you forgot to put it in post fader and you turned down the kick drum what would the sub do and uh, what would they be what would they be drum. hearing in the in the main mix yep you would you would hear nothing the, the kick drum would sit so if you turn on the kick drum in the main mix and you forgot to change that pickoff point if you, you were are in pre fader i mean -fader. if you forgot to if you were in pre fader and you forgot to put your mix in post fader mm -hmm. then what would you hear if you brought down the main fader of that of the kick drum say uh kick drum would well if you had the kick drum fader in the main mix set like this you would hear no change you would still hear that a ton amazing, of low end woofer. super <laughs> yeah super woofy yeah. sub heavy right. content um because you've you, you know you've pulled that channel down on the main mix um so all you're really getting is the the super low end of that kick drum you're not right. getting a snap and it's it's gonna sound weird and the reason for that is the the final step and kind of setting this up for uh, a subwoofer use, which would be to apply your crossover. So we're mm -hmm. delivering this content into the sub. We've got our pickoff point range, so our, our, our main main fader is still adju adjusting and dictating that level. Um, but still, it's a subwoofer, so even though, yes, we've told it, you know, we're only giving you the, the low-end stuff, we're only giving you the kick drum, we're only giving you the bass guitar, don't worry. You still want to apply a crossover because there are still um, you know, frequencies and harmonics to those uh, channels that are above a whatever the, the set frequency range that a subwoofer wants to handle or wants to receive. So um, to do that, I'm going to go to again. I'm going to go into my output settings here by selecting the output of the uh, fader. There, I'm going to go into my parametric EQ for this output indicated with the PEQ parametric EQ, and I'm going to engage the high cut filter. And I'm going to select the frequency knob there, and I'm going to dial that down to the frequency where I want to set my crossover point to. Typically, this is going to be anywhere between 80 and 120 hertz. Um, depending on the, your gear, you might want to look up the specs um, or, or check check the specs or the FAQ on the manufacturer's website. They're you know more, more than likely post the recommended for crossover frequency for your subwoofers and your top speakers. Uh, I'm just going to choose 100 hertz uh, for this example. So I'll, I've, I've gone and done that. I've got my, my, my subwoofer filter, which is half of the crossover um, engaged there. So now this output, this aux output is only going to be delivering content at 100 hertz and below, which is going to make our subwoofer really, really happy because that's all it wants to do. Now, the inverse of that is setting up an, the, an inverse filter on our main output. So I'm going to go to my main mix now. I'm going to go into my main output settings. And now in the parametric EQ for my main output, I'm going to set up the opposite filter at the same frequency. And this is going to be a low cut. So I can engage my low cut there. I'll select my frequency knob and I'll set that to that same 100 hertz. Now I've got a 100 hertz crossover between my sub aux output and my main output. So my top box speakers are handling everything from 100 hertz and above. So now they're happy because they don't have to worry about um, you know, recreating that that power hungry low frequency content, we're giving all that to subwoofers and that's their job. And the subwoofers are happy because they're only getting that, that really low end stuff that, that they, they're happy with and, and what is what their job is. So there you go. You've got your, your crossover set. We've got our pickoff point changed. Now you have your main output fader here, which will dictate, as I turn this, you won't hear my voice anymore, which will dictate the level of your top speakers. And then I can go to, uh, let's see. Where the yeah, aux master is right in front of my face, uh, the aux aux three, which I set up for my sub, and if I want to lower my sub, I can do that like that. So I have independent control over my left and right top speakers and my subwoofer, just like that. And even though I have independent control like this, I can still give myself a single fader that I can control my entire system with. That's that's a cool cool uh, tip tip and trick here. Um, I can. Um, apply a DCA uh, and set up a DCA to give myself a single fader, which will control both of these channels at once. So if I need to adjust my 
top boxes, I grab my main fader and I adjust that accordingly. I adjust my subwoofer, I can do that accordingly. But then once I've got those kind of set and I like where they are, I want to have the ability to just take the entire PA up or down, right? I go into a DCA. I can hit the DCA one is fine. I'm not really using any DCAs at this point. And I can say, okay, I know I want to have my main and aux three, which is my subwoofer. And there you go. That's it. Now, if I hit home, back out of my DCA screen. Now my DCA one fader will control both those channels in unison. So I have uh, an overall system fader and then I have my independent faders. Oops. So when the band really gets pumping and you're pushing them up and up and up as the night goes on, you can use that DCA fader as your main house as the and main it'll turn house. up the sub right with it. Right with it. Everything goes up, everything yep. comes down. And then once you get it yep. to, once you get it to a certain level and you're like, ah, maybe the sub's a little loud, you can still go to that aux put and pull the sub down a little bit, you know, but but then you still have your your overall fader control, your yeah, system control. And I'm also gonna do this. Which, is, which I should have done in the first place. Labeling is a good idea. This box <laughs> sub. So now wherever I am on the board, I can clearly see this is my sub output control. And then on my DCA, I can also name this system. Boom. So just makes it really easy to stay organized and know what you're adjusting at any given time. Labeling is, is, is a big part of my normal workflow. I've, when I'm kind of loose and, and, and doing examples here, I sometimes forget to do it, but um, so yeah, the other thing that's that cool, The other thing that's cool about what um, you just did, Jason, by adding the subs and main in the same DCA, you can also add any fill speakers that you have put out there. For example, Correct. if you needed a fill speaker to bring out the vocals more where the, the left and right weren't handling it, mm -hmm. you would also add that fill speaker Absolutely. to that. DCA. So when you brought all the house up, all of it goes up, including yes. the fills. Including the or, fills, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, same could be said if you have uh, uh, delayed speakers. Exactly. Um, you know, so, so you know, you're, you're, you want to set up you know, the entire PA as, as one system so the whole thing can go up and the whole thing can go down. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. And it's, again, just as easy as you know, coming in here and selecting the channels that you want to include in that uh, DCA. And, and just um, if you're unfamiliar with a D, what a TCA is, a DCA is essentially just a channel group. It allows you to group channels together, either inputs or outputs, um, so that you can just control the volume of those channels with a single fader. Um, and this, this is an excellent example of uh, use of a DCA. Another example would be um, like channel groups, like a, like a drum set. If you've got, you know, five, seven, you know, channels dedicated to all the drum set mics. You can put all of those channels on a CA fader and you have one fader that can just you know, turn up the drum set, turn down the drum set once you've got all the, the, ind the independent faders mixed and balanced properly. Yep. Uh, cool. So, yeah, I think that about covers it. I mean, I don't really know what else to get into uh, as far as aux mixes. And clearly, you know, kind of navigating around the touch mix, it makes it pretty easy to set any of these situations up. You know, whether it's mixing monitors, you know, setting up a, a discrete broadcast or recording mix, setting up a, a subwoofer output, things like that. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of there. It's really straightforward and it's easy to, to get around and just get those things up and running very quickly. Yep. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, that's, I think that's all I got. And I think we're, that's, that's a pretty good amount of time. I think we went a little over what we were intended, but that's fine because we were having fun. Yeah. You know, once we get talking, you just. I know. It's stop. hard to stop. <laughs> going. Um, are there any that say, I think we handled all the questions that came through. Um, uh, real quick, any, any, if anyone has any last minute questions they want to throw in the chat, we'd be happy to, to cover those. Well, I see William. Um, talking about using DCAs as subgroups. Yeah, oh, perfect examples. So well, that is probably works. something you might want to touch since we don't have subgroups on the TouchMix 16. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, good point. Um, so what I've shown here are, yeah, are the DCAs, which gives you, uh, you know, channel groups. Um, basically it gives you level control and mute control. That's what a DCA does. You can control the, the volume and you can mute, mute a group of channels um, all at once with a single channel fader. Um, a subgroup 
takes that um, a step further and allows you to apply processing and effects to a group of channels. So, you know, um, and I, again, the TouchMix 16 doesn't have subgroups. That's a little bit more processor intensive. Um, that feature is included on the TouchMix 30, uh, which is the, the largest TouchMix model, the sort of the flagship model. Um, there are uh, just a handful of features that are on that mixer that aren't included on the 8 and 16, and that is one of them, the, the ability to use subgroups, um, which again, just gives you um, the ability to whoops, set up a, I'll just punch back over to my, my big self, um, yeah, it gives you the ability to, to set up a channel group like a drum set or a horn section or a vocal section um, or, or your, your multiple keyboards or a couple of guitars, you know, any, whatever it might be. And then you can apply um, an EQ to that whole group or a compressor to the whole group or effects. You know, you can put reverb or delay you know, on that entire group of channels uh, uniformly. Um, so there's, a, there's many, many uses for those. And uh, we actually just released uh, a couple of application videos which um, explain all of that and walk through you know how to set that all up and a um, couple of different scenarios in which those can be, be really helpful so go check oh i think somebody yeah there they are we posted them in yeah the chat. there you check go yeah out. those are really cool subgroups may be a good discussion at some point it is we should definitely do that how about next time next time after so we're not going to do this again um until after the holidays coming up here right but uh, we'll be back in January, and we'll be hitting this uh, every other week, possibly every week, with yep. um, audio and mixing topics. And so maybe we'll do that. Maybe when we come back in January, we'll do subgroups, because yeah. that's a pretty fun topic. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Um, well, I think that's it. I think it's, it's good. So we'll say sayonara. Happy <laughs> Wednesday. It's been awesome chatting with you. Yeah, you too. Always awesome chatting with you. Uh, have a good holiday. Have a good holiday, everybody out there. Have a good break. Hope everyone's safe and has fun and gets to see family and yeah, jolly times. Yeah, I'm going to see my family in Florida and Missouri. So <laughs> Traveling. Yeah. Traveling yeah. holiday. <laughs> so awesome. happy holidays, everyone. Definitely. Happy holidays. And we will see you again uh, sometime in January. Hope to see you all there.